You know, one of the things that we frequently don't get to see are the finished product of our of our designs. Right. We turn out the drawings, the stuff that we're involved with gets built fairly early in the overall stage of construction and when the building is done, we, those chances that we have, maybe you get more of them than I do, but very seldom do we get to really see mm -hmm. and be invited to the opening of the building that we've been involved with. Oh, we're never invited to the openings. <laughs> few, very few cases. Very few. <laughs> And that's good because you don't have to listen to the the uh, politicians the speech. Yeah, who yes. provided all the money. Who provided all the money. <laughs> yes. Our having come on board with uh, uh, Lucon was the magnet that attracted a lot, a lot of the younger, how do you say, forward-moving contemporary architects, Mitchell Jurgel and several others as well. And as well, at the same time, having met Venturi and working with Bob, uh, the young community of architects, professionals here, figured that, well, Keith Newt has something to offer. And our clients grew out principally of the contemporary work we did. The preservation work grew almost on a parallel track with that. Some of the, the things that I think I brought to the uh, firm were uh, a different perspective on the quality of drawings and uh, documentation and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, the, the skill, the analytical skills were there. Uh, I, I didn't bring anything to help out on that, but uh, the uh, uh, presentation of the work the work product uh, is something that uh, we developed a pretty high quality drafting standard and our drawings and documents were the envy of a lot of the other people. Uh, a lot of our competitors would just say, well, our drawings good thing and people build the stuff and whatever. But the contractors always gave better prices for our work because everything was shown. All the details were there. The presentation was good. Uh, the dimensions were on the drawings, all the drawings, not just the foundation plan. And uh, the, uh, the skills of Tom Leidig, Nick Giannopoulos, uh, and some of the other people we had working for us on and off, uh, were recognized by a lot of architects. They don't want to pay for it, but they recognized the, the ability. And um, I, I think that the, the service we gave to clients, uh, we would sit and work with them. Uh, this is very important with design-oriented architects, that they, they want you to sit there and listen to all their ideas and then solve the problems. And uh, Nick and Tom are very good at that. Uh, I, I guess I get along, but... <laughs> But uh, that is the, the basis, and it continued, and it went on, and you would work with all kinds of different people, and you would uh, do a lot of things uh, beyond the, the scope, if you will. Uh, a lot of unpaid time just holding hands and uh, leading people in the right path or talking to them about ideas and how this can work and how that cannot work and so forth. Um, some were adamant in the, the uh, architecture is sacrosanct, and it isn't. Um, I did a number of jobs with Bob Venturi, and if you would say to Bob, it just doesn't work, you, you, you have to do something here, he would do it. He would change his design so that we could make the thing stand up in the air, and that was my job. <laughs> uh. I guess some of the things that I remember most are not the buildings, there were some buildings, but a lot of non-building structures. At one time there was a big airplane parked up in back 
of the, the Franklin Institute. I was the one who designed the support for that after it was brought in. Uh, and you had a search to find out what are the wind forces on it. Well, the plane was designed for landing forces when the plane comes down and wind for not much help. They could give us the dead weight of the plane and that was about all. And we had to go from there. We most times would eat together. Uh, if people had some place to go, uh, they did not join us. Uh, quite often we would talk business uh, at lunchtime. Um, we didn't have closed doors. The only time you would close the door if you had one would be to change your pants or to chew somebody out, which didn't happen too much, but uh, occasionally that had to be done. Um, but uh, that's when we would do things. And um, we, of course, had our different philosophies. Uh, Nick was the great paternalist, I'm the hardliner, Tom's the compromiser. Uh, we always got along on a consensus basis. Maybe we're Quakers, I don't know. But, uh, but uh, Tom's uh, middle name should have been Glue. <laughs> <laughs> but it was arm wrestling and disagreements and so forth. But uh, as our old accounts would say, a partnership is like a marriage. And it is, you have to give and take and all that kind of thing. And, uh, we managed to pull it off, I guess. Well, we, had, we had outside our accountants and our lawyer and, the, and some of the people that helped with the insurance and so forth. I think we had good advice mm -hmm. oh, excellent. from, yes. from yeah. them. We were fortunate to, sure. to wind up with, with good backup. And this early on when we had some extra money, they talked us into starting a profit sharing plan. And that worked very well over the years. Oh yeah, in fact, we were way ahead of the curve. Yeah. On that, mm -hmm. way ahead of the curve. All due to the advice of uh, our accountants. Yeah. Real mm -hmm. college. When Olivetti came out with the little calculator, programmable calculator, we got one and started to use it. My sense was not that we were saving money by using a computer, but that we were doing better work. Because if we were going to do a calculation involving some stability of a retaining wall or something, we could put numbers in and get an answer. And then we could vary the numbers, the input, by a little bit and get a different answer. And we could get three or four answers just as quickly and at that point then decide which one was better based on the outcome of it rather than uh, having when we did it by hand if we got close that was it you know your description of that reminds me of another job at Hershey one there was one of the columns oh yeah one of the factory one. Go ahead. That's a good one. in the Go factory ahead. building that was starting to come apart it had been a cooler room next to it, and the moisture had gotten from that cool room into the column and begun to rust the rebar, and it needed help. And, uh, but the plant, the stuff that was above it, was in use 24, 24 hours, a hours a day, seven days a week. Right. They would shut down only for Christmas uh, Day. Christmas Day. I, I think I don't know whether it was Christmas. It might have been a Labor Day weekend or well, something like that. But uh, just have a couple days to work. We decided we could put steel columns around it and then encase it in uh, concrete. But to get the load into there without a elaborate system of jacks. I called for them to put the steel in loose, to build boxes around it and fill them with ice cubes, to get the column to shrink, and then to put the shims in under the construction above, and then knock down the boxes and get rid of the ice. And so that way we induced 
the load that we needed from the column into this new support structure. I was, I thought that was a pretty good application. That, well, that was, yes. a, that was that a dandy. Was very, very. I, I've good. repeated that one many times. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What are the, what are, okay. you know, um, Tom and I had uh, worked with Lou Kahn a lot, and Lou was a colorful guy, and we, you know, Lou really wasn't like what the press, mm -hmm. you know, uh, depicted him as being, and, and here are all these books that are coming out by people who never knew Lou. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they try to imbue certain qualities on the man. You know, he was unique and this and that and so on, but uh, he was a personal, very personal guy, you know. And yeah, and he, he wanted to understand, when we would tell him that we needed to do something, surely. he wanted to under, understand it all the way. Sure. So we, um, uh, you know, worked with him. It was 22 years. Mm -hmm. Was it? 22 years we worked with the guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many roast beef sandwiches we had, you know, <laughs> on the bar around mm -hmm. the corner. <laughs> but... Um, and the aquavit. What's that? And the aquavit. Oh. Oh, well, when Tom and I would go over, <laughs> he, he, he used to owe us great sums of money. And, uh, well, of course, uh, Pakistan wasn't paying him promptly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Tom and I would go over to talk to him, and he'd take us in his little front room, which was not much bigger than his table. And he had a table, and a, had a bench, and on a bench he had this wonderful hand-woven uh, woven blanket. So he'd open that back, and here would be a pint of Aquavit. <laughs> and he'd get the glasses out. You know, he, he said, I don't have any money for you, but we can't have a drink. 